We're not crazy. The system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3, Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall. Today, our guest is Peter Stotzny, who's a dissident psychiatrist. But first, a little bit about Madness Radio. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Freedom Center is a Northampton, Massachusetts-based uh, community of people working for alternatives to the mainstream psychiatric system, people who are working against psychiatric abuse and creating holistic options and choices for people. We have a website, freedom-center.org, and we have a number of events and classes and groups that happen on a regular basis, so check out our website, freedom-center.org. Madness Radio is also co-sponsored by the Icarus Project. The Icarus Project is a international online community, primarily online community, but there are some local groups as well of people who are diagnosed with bipolar and other psychiatric disorders and don't identify with the medical model of understanding our experiences. So check out theicarusproject.net. My guest today is Peter Stotzny. He is a dissident psychiatrist based in New York City. And I'll just read his uh, bio here. Peter Stotzny received his medical degree from the University of Vienna and completed a psychiatric residency at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. Since then, Peter has conducted research on the effects of long-term institutionalization, family influence, peer support, self-help, and advanced directives. Peter has been a consultant and founding member of several user-run organizations, and has provided advocacy and expert testimony in many cases dealing with psychiatric malpractice and forced treatment. Peter is also a documentary filmmaker and author of many scholarly and literary articles. He has worked with the Bureau of Recipient Affairs, that's what it's called, the Bureau of Recipient Affairs at the New York State Office of Mental Health, and he served on the board of Windhorse Associates, which is based here in Northampton, Massachusetts, the National Association of Rights Protection and Advocacy, and he is a associate professor of psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. Um, Peter with Darby Penny, who's been a guest on the show, and photographer Lisa Rinsler was curator at the New York State Museum's exhibit Lost Cases, Recovered Lives, Suitcases from a State Hospital Attic, uh, which is about the Willard State Hospital in rural New York State. Peter is also one of the leading organizers of INTAR, the International Network of Treatment Alternatives for Recovery. Peter, thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio. You're welcome. Hey, so um, it was really great to be at the um, NYU event with you last week. Uh, Peter, Robert Whitaker, myself, and Brad Lewis, who's a um, professor there, all gave a talk, um, presentation about, I guess, what was it titled? I don't remember exactly. It had something to do with uh, Zyprexa and psychopharmacology, but, you know, to be honest, I don't remember it either. Well, it was a pretty cool event, and I I really... um, I really appreciated the different things that you had to say about um, hospitals and the work that you've been doing about um, creating alternatives to hospitalization. And I also want to talk about your work with uh, INTAR. There's a big conference coming up in British Columbia. But, but, you know, Peter, I don't actually even know that much about your history. How did you get involved with this? I know that you're an MD uh, psychiatrist, but how did you start getting involved in dissident sort of alternative um, beyond the mainstream kind of views to begin with? Well, I was involved with uh, anti-psychiatric work before I ever came near psychiatry as a medical student, and I was involved with a group uh, called Democratic Psychiatry in Austria, and we wanted to uh, close down the mental institution in Vienna. So uh, that's how I first got involved. This is like my mid-70s. So you were you were a med student, and was that successful? Did you guys get the? No, I graduated from medical school. That was successful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that we, part. I mean, the other success, the, the shutting no, down the that, hospital. That part. hospital still stands. Uh, um, Vienna. It, that's the that's like the birthplace of Freud, huh? That's kind of like being behind enemy lines there. In some well, way. he stayed away from the from that hospital. Although he was a neurologist for some time, but that hospital has transformed itself into. Uh, now it's called Wagner Jaurek Hospital, 
Which, you know, I don't know if we have time for a sidebar story about Bring. Wagner, Yarek, and Freud. Bring him, <laughs> bring it on. Oh, but Va- Wagner, Yarek was the, was the head of that hospital in the uh, first part of the uh, 20th century, and he was a biological psychiatrist, and he had, during the First World War, he had to uh, take care of a lot of people coming back from the front lines. Shell shock. A shell shock, yeah. And so he used electri- an electrical device on them. He wanted to shock them back to war duty. Is that kind of like the origins of homeopathic treatment? Or I something? wouldn't go, go that far. It's very maybe, maybe the origins of electroshock treatment. Hmm. But uh, he, and, he had a dispute, and he was sued by a patient, and they had a hearing, and Freud sort of testified against the method, but for the man. Interesting. So that was pretty interesting. I just actually learned the story. But that's the name of the hospital now, Wagner Yarek Hospital. And then at some, but at some point you came to the U.S., right? After I finished my uh, medical school and then I did some training in Vienna, but I uh, continued uh, in a, in a New York to train as a psychiatrist. Did you keep doing the anti-psychiatry work? In the U.S. then? Is that yeah, I mean, at first I started to do kind of more left-wing type of work where I wanted to set up uh, sort of radical psychoanalytic storefront clinics in the South Bronx. And that was uh, unfortunately not successful because the uh, psychoanalysts, even if they were radicals or left-wingers, they didn't want to give up their private practices. You know, there was a time when psychoanalysis was considered as potentially revolutionary, at least by some people. How, how so? Well, you know, it can liberate people. People can become more aware of what oppresses them and can become both internally and externally and uh, get more active and more uh, less repressed. You know, you remember Wilhelm Reich? Yeah. Was one of the people who promoted the uh, sexual revolution, but also... Others were more into the social revolution. I was working with a guy named Joel Covell, who was a Marxist and psychoanalyst. Joel Covell, yeah. I think he actually ran for president um, on, recently on the Green Party ticket or something. Yeah, he's now very green, and he's a professor at Bard at College. At Bard College, yeah, yeah. And he gave up psychoanalysis, but at that time he was my supervisor. In fact, he was the director of the residency training program at Albert Einstein. So the idea is that you have instinctual forces that are, are need to be come to terms with, but you also have oppressive forces in society that you need to be... To well, sort of the basic idea is that, uh, that you, you conform, you know, that the superego wins, and that uh, in psychoanalysis you don't necessarily have that. I mean, in psychoanalysis you can actually come to uh, different positions rather than the one that's kind of uh, promoted by the state. But nowadays, psychoanalysis is not really that radical anymore. I mean, that's probably why Joel Covell left it behind. What What happened? I mean, why is it? Because that, I mean, this, was this sort of just a symptom of the uh, the '60s with uh, Herbert Marcuse and the sort of left um, left wing Freudian that sort of fizzled out, or what? Why is it that it kind of didn't continue? Well, it has a lot of reasons. Part of the reason is because most psychoanalysts. Uh, are in private practice and they rely on wealthy patrons to pay for psychoanalysis so that it's become very insular both in terms of the people that are can afford it and it's also the people that are being trained for it you know so in terms of it being more open i mean there was a time when uh, psychoanalysis was even involved with the revolution in nicaragua for example there was a, an analyst from Mexico by the name of Marie Langer, who worked uh, with the Sandinista government. And and they were really interested in looking at the sort of liberating potential of psychoanalysis. But it doesn't, isn't psychoanalysis about um, introspection and kind of finding the problem, the source of the problem within your own mind and your own past? How does it well, lend that, to that's social... Only one School of psychoanalysis. I mean, there there are other schools that are see it much broader. Whether it was Reich or Adler or Marcuse, or uh, they see uh, societal transformation as deriving from. I mean, in, they don't see it possible to really make individual transformation without societal transformation. 
So what, what would these p- clients, did you actually have patients that were sort of working in this framework and what kinds of things did they discover and get, get well, involved in? How I, did I it help them? I think we shouldn't go take this too far. No, I'm, fas- I'm fascinated, man. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's just because it, it didn't actually happen. You know, ah, the, okay. the thing was that what happened instead was basically we split the, the psychoanalytic piece from the social revolutionary piece. So the group we started, actually Joel Covell and a bunch of others, was called the Group for a Radical Human Science. And in the end, we were working for like five or six years. And in the end, there was a split between those who really wanted to work in communities and those who really wanted to work uh, with uh, patients on the couch. And that's what ended up happening. So, I mean, there are lots of feminist psychoanalysts, for example, who believe that their work is radical and liberating. Jessica Benjamin is one of them. She was a, a member of this group and Muriel Dimon. I mean, there were a bunch of people. But they had become, in you, you know, they had become sort of institutionalized in their own uh, private practice. And that has a really problematic Im- impact. Interesting. So at some point you started to look at um, a different perspective, sort of critiquing biomedical psychiatry and looking at the hospital system. Well, how I did, was how always, they... my main critique was really uh, anti-institutional. You know, it was not prim- not so you know not so much. That's why I'm still even talking more about hospitals versus uh, uh, medications. I know that medications are very uh, devilish in many ways, if I, if I want to use a, a mild mild word. <laughs> but I, I think the institutional framework was very important. And back then, when I was active, you know, the people who were most uh, radical, at least the people that we were close to were the Italian mental health workers and Basalia and others. Interesting. Whose revolution was really based on uh, a class class uh, struggle. You know, it was based on increasing the awareness of the workers that were maintaining mental institutions and maintaining patients in the role, a role below slaves, really. I mean, certainly slaves, but and they and and they and that became a liberation movement because the workers in, and psychiatrists in the institution became aware of their oppressive role and decided to change that. And so I was very much involved with that stuff. Interesting. And that was very successful in Italy. Weren't they able to sort of abolish a lot of the hospitals and get people into the community and real community alternatives for people? And well, it was successful to the you know in terms of the law that that became. Uh, uh, you know, Im- implemented that that allowed no further admissions to uh, uh, to state in- t- state institutions, and then many state institutions closed down and were transformed, and other types of institutions came up. You know, like community-based services were developed, but those were not as radical as the initial impetus for the transformation. Of these institutions, is it is it better in Italy for um, psychiatrically labeled and psychiatrically identified people? Do you think there are pockets where it is, and but in the majority of Italy, it's not. There are certain places, like in Turin or in Trieste, uh, where there has been some change. But basically, what happened was that people were so, sort of liberated, but then they were, uh, you know, largely ignored. With some exceptions, you know, there was attempts to create further organizations like in Trieste. Former patients became quite active in in uh, starting cooperatives and businesses. But you know, it really it was a it was still a top down kind of revolution. You know, it was a revolution that was carried by the professional class and never. I mean, so unlike the revolution that. Or, or at least the transformation that's been happening in America, where you know former patient survivors are articulating and organizing themselves, this was really top down. So, so in Italy, you don't hardly have a ex patient survivor movement, which is very telling about uh, how that revolution sort of was basically a, a dictate in some ways. Well, it's interesting. It seems like the um, the ex the patients consumer survivor movement in the United States has made a lot of headway, but it seems like there are some conditions on that headway that 
that certain things can't really be questioned, like the role of medication is something that can't really be questioned, and also the role of force, forced treatment, is something that really can't be questioned. And well, even the the diagnosis itself gets gets to gets to be something that's just kind of accepted. I mean, wh- what are your thoughts about that? Well, I don't really see it that way. I mean, I think that maybe by now, like we're, we're sort of twenty five or thirty years into this movement in America, uh, maybe by now some of those voices have uh, quieted down, but I I think that that was the core. I mean, certainly the fight against coercion was very strong when I first came into into the movement, and it was one of the things that I was most active with in the first five or ten years. What, is that in the early 80s? No, it was in the mid-80s, the late 80s, yeah. But at the same time, this other thing happened, which I think really, you know, and I was very instrumental in that, and I'm not so sure if I should be proud of it, because the whole question of getting, you know, enabling former patients to become mental health providers or peer peer workers, I, you know, I now have my serious doubts that that was actually a very positive development. I mean, it might have been positive for those individual people, and there was some chance, depending on, you know, the character and the sort of the, the, the energy and the, the dedication of individuals, individual people, but by and large, I think co-optation reigns, and that's where you have this problem that people are not articulating any positions against medication or against coercion. They're basically told to keep fairly quiet about those things. That kind of becomes a condition of their employment and the well, co-optation dynamic. Unspoken, yeah. yeah, unspoken and sometimes even spoken, but I see it as a big problem. I see it as also like a big siphoning off of a lot of resources. Now, if if the same amount of money had been spent on people working in, in independent advocacy positions, that there would have been probably much different kind of development. Yeah, I've often felt that pressure personally. Like if I would kind of tone my, my whole act down, I could probably come up with a pretty nice <laughs> nice institutional job somewhere for myself. And I think right. I other, mean, I think New York I, State has been, you know, I you know, shouldn't get too far into that, actually. But most of the states that have bought into this model have essentially hired quite a number of people. Not that many, you know, in, in the end. But, but those people are... You know, they're bringing a certain perspective. We just had a meeting here where people talked about the recovery perspective and all, all kinds of things that are still quite alien to the mental health workers and the professionals. So it's not a bad thing to have that, but it's not a revolutionary thing. Yeah, and, it's, and it, has, it has this missing piece about the medication and the force. So tell us about that. I know you've done a lot of really interesting research on the problems that the medication have and the way in which the hospitalization industry you described it really can create more trouble for people than it solves so tell us for someone who's maybe not familiar with that or who's like well wait wait a second isn't hospitals good aren't medications good what what are sort of the results of your research and you've looked into this well um you know i can say some of the things i said on 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 friday but what happens is basically people and especially young people who haven't had much exposure exposure to the mental health system when they get into a serious crisis, whether it's a suicidal crisis or, or a manic episode or, or when they really go, you know, psychotic where they have very unusual experiences that most people don't share, then they end up in the hospital and often against their will. And, you know, very quickly they're being treated with serious dosages of medication, sometimes more than one medication, even more than two. And that's what happens. So, the, so this is kind of the package deal that you get when you go through any one of those major crises, that you end up in a hospital against your will, usually, very more, more often than not. And after three, two, three, four weeks, you come out fully loaded with uh, a variety of drugs, and you're totally not feeling yourself. I mean, there's no way that you're going to be feeling like yourself when you're you know, aside from the long-term risk or even the medium-term risk in terms of metabolic problems, diabetes and whatnot, and obesity, you're, you know, and I, one of the people that I, you know, Sally Clay, I heard her say this years ago, the transformation, and I've heard many people actually say this, the transformation the first time you go in is radical. You know, the person 
is transformed into someone that they're not familiar with, into someone that, that may not be able to form a thought, someone that may not be able to get up off a couch, someone that uh, may not be able to express any feelings. So, so I think it's a radical transformation of a personality induced by drugs and by the experience of being in the hospital, because that comes along with it, you see. Like, again, you know, I made a movie a few years ago where, uh, you know, one of the people, Mimi Kravitz, gives such a graphic description, like, you know, you have to take off your clothes, you're being put in a robe, you're given a bar of dial soap, and you're a mental patient. You know, and some people stay that for life. And that's not what, what even mental illness, even if you believe in mental illness, that's not about mental illness at all. It's about what is being done to you when you're being put in that kind of an environment and treated in that way. So I think that's the most horrifying aspect of the whole mental health system. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Someone For a starts lot of to, people. yeah, people start to believe the messages that they're. they yeah. basically it's a train. It's a training process where someone is trained and socialized into a new role. And then, right. they, and then there's money involved. So you get you get a disability check, or you get services yeah, or housing. And if they don't get it the first time, then then it's repeated a few times because a lot of people, obviously, we know that eighty percent of the people try to stop the drugs within the first couple of years. And why do they stop the drugs? Because they feel bad on the drugs, you know, because they just don't see the point. And, you know, they, they stop the drugs for a lot of very good reasons. But then it has to repeat itself, you know, so that a lot of people have to do this three, four, five, six, seven times until finally uh, there's no way out. And it's, it's clearly, to me, it, there's, it's an oppressive quality to it. It's really kind of like beating someone's wildness, taming someone, domesticating someone. But for someone who's maybe listening to the, to the show and doesn't quite get what the issues are here, what about the argument that says, well, you know, sure, it's, it, going to the hospital can be degrading and the medications can be awful, but hey, these people have an illness. They've got psychosis. They've got madness. They've got these extreme states that they go into, and that's worse than what the hospital system or the, or the mental health system puts them through. What, what would you say to that? Well, what I would say to that is that the, the logic that you have to treat extreme states with extreme measures is false. It's faulty logic. In fact, uh, uh, extreme states can be dealt with with subtle and, and, and quiet methods. In fact, that's one very sure way of helping people come out of extreme states is when you're when you when you're there, you're you're willing to engage, but you're not willing to pounce on the person. You're you're not willing to, you know, to to restrain that person physically and inject them. But you are, uh, you know, you're saying I'm here. I'm willing to be present for you. Like in Soteria House, for example, that was the main. Uh, that was an, uh, a facility. I don't know if the the listeners are familiar with it, but. That was a place where people could go in an extreme state of mind and find other people that were essentially both staff and other, other fellow travelers uh, would be willing to tolerate and support a person in such an extreme state. And lo and behold, the vast majority of people came back from those extreme states without, without these drastic measures. And they, so they didn't use the, um, the force or the drugging, and they just basically approached people from right. a very open... Because right. that's, that's, I think, what's so striking is that it's, it's not just the person who goes into the psychotic or crisis or emotional distress, but the people around them are also totally freaking out and just doing exactly. well, bullying that's why them. Do and that's that's con- why they behave in this manner. Yeah, there's a relationship to the context. Yeah, I mean, the, what, 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 talk about suicide for a minute. What, what do you think is a be- better way of dealing with a suicidal person. A person says, oh, I'm feeling like killing myself. And the next thing you do is you tie him to a chair and you have him hauled off and locked up into a hospital for weeks. Or you basically continue to talk to them and you continue to listen to them, sometimes maybe for many hours, but eventually the two of you together, if you really work hard, and maybe you need other people involved too, can come up with, with a way for that person to continue living. What's the better method? Research shows that that's actually the better method. Yeah, that's that's the really the crucial part here is that you know you and other people we've had on the show. It's not just a fanciful vision that's based on good values. It's actually good science. What you're saying there actually are research studies that show that this is 
that this is if is is effective these are effective ways i know with the suicide question um i uh, gave a talk um last year to some graduate students and i was talking to them about not using force and the alternatives and and um, a woman said, well, you know, I, I had this experience where I was, I, I just a couple of weeks ago, I was, I'm interning at a clinic and we had to force somebody into the hospital because they were suicidal. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, he came in and he said he was suicidal. And so I said, well, did you offer him the option of, of making his own decisions about whether he wanted to go into the hospital or not? And she said, well, yes, we did give him the option. We said, do you want to go into the hospital? But he couldn't decide. He couldn't make up a decision. He couldn't make up his mind. And then I said, well, then what happened? He says, well, five o'clock came around and we had to close the clinic. So we just forced him into the hospital. And I said, well, you know, that's clearly that's the problem is if you're based on bureaucratic priorities and you're not able to just provide someone a simple, you're in a crisis, let's hang out. Let me just be patient with you for as long as it takes. And instead, because the whistle blows and then you just cart someone away and then use force to do it, I mean, there's really something very, very wrong there with the priorities that the system is presenting. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, it was interesting that that uh, today in the New York Times uh, there was an editorial about about parity in mental health uh, care. Right. Where right. a lot of you know, there's two bills in front of Congress now that are you know suggesting that mental health care should be covered just like any other medical condition. But the person writing the article said that. Um, you know, it's really important to make sure that what is what is covered isn't just humbug, you know, and is is actually effective, helpful stuff. And a lot of people are against parity because what would be covered under it would be forced treatment, you and, know, and they, and they, more drugs and, and more drugs. It's not question. It's not the question of the spending. It's a question of what are we spending it on? Right. I mean, in, and a lot of people, even people who are for drug treatment. Don't understand that we're we're not you know the drugs cost a lot, but compared to what a hospitalization costs, it's really very little. And the money that's being spent on unnecessary hospitalizations or on harmful hospitalizations is huge. Is huge. And I think that most reasonable if you take a poll of community psychiatrists in the world, most of them would tell you that at least fifty to sixty percent of the hospitalizations that happen today are not necessary. And some would even, I mean, I would certainly go as high as, you know, whatever, 95%. I mean, and there are occasions when uh, a person is, is a, you know, in this, you know I, don't, I don't agree with any type of force, by the way, just to be clear on that, that's, that's committed by a medical practitioner. I do not, I believe that psychiatrists should not be in the authority to force someone uh, into a hospital or into treatment. Well, what about the argument that would say, well, the person is suicidal, so of course we have to um, use force well, to protect them. I, I think them. If, if the case were that, that, that a person is about to jump out the window, or a person, it shouldn't be up to psychiatrists. It should be up to society and not a, a medical practitioner to make those kinds of determinations. Like in Italy, a psychiatrist cannot lock up a person in a mental institution. That's a, an amazing thing to hear. Uh, in Italy, you have to go to a judge or you have to go to the mayor of the town. Now, it's possible that the mayor of the town will be even more conservative than the psychiatrist. It's possible. But I think it's a huge distinction. And, and, and it's something that I learned from a guy named Ron Thompson, who was a lawyer and an activist for many years. He made the distinction between practicing medicine and practicing coercion. And when those two are conflated, you are basically on the slippery slope towards Auschwitz, you know, <laughs> or towards, you're on the slippery slope towards where medicine can also kill. And, and that's why I'm so against, uh, against uh, coercion in psychiatry, because I think doctors should not be involved in that stuff. Now, if, if the doctor feels really strongly, maybe he might have to appeal to a judge. Uh, you know, but, but it's really important, just like you want to separate the church from the state, you should also be separating medicine from from the the executive powers of the state. What about the our argument that the medications are really you know helping people to not be suicidal and saving lives? And this is something that we hear quite a bit. Well, you know, medications may be helpful sometimes. You know, but are we talking about forced medications or are we just simply talking about 
a person taking medication. Well, I was I was thinking about just medications in general people are choosing because a lot of people take them and once they're on them they think, well, I have to stay on these these meds because you know, the the suicide rate is so high for mm-hmm. bipolar disorder or so high for schizophrenia that I better stay on my well, on my the, drugs. Yeah, there, there are there are different problems. The, the problem of a person starting to take a medication for the first time is a different one than a per- person who's already taken medication, already been on medication for some time. And those need to be approached somewhat differently. Like when you're first thinking about starting on medication that you've never been, bef- been on before, I think you have to exhaust all other possibilities before, you know, you actually start the medication. And there are medications. I one years ago I came up with like a sort of hierarchy of toxicity. Right. You know that that, that the least toxic alternative is what I w- I called it back you know back then. And you know once you start getting into medications, there are certain ones that are less much less toxic than others. Yeah. The sli- the sleeping the benzodiazepines. Yeah, or the benzo- but yeah. of course the a lot of you know those often have a lot of problems. Have yeah. a lot of problems because people become addicted to them and they like them and. Yeah, they're actually they're, they are more more addictive than the opiates. Yeah, what, but, do, you, um, what, what do you such think is sti- least to- one of the least toxic substances if used in the correct dosages? Well, I mean, I, I know the answer to this. It's, it would be opiates or heroin. Heroin but heroin's very is very non toxic. Heroin a lot is of ways. the least toxic of all things. It, yeah. it doesn't cause any. And it's unlike alcohol or nicotine, for example. Right. Right. Causes no really hardly any harm to the to your body but you know i'm not here to promote people using heroin but the point is that the the whole question of the not the least toxic alternatives isn't exhausted first before the more heavy because i mean the the neuroleptic the the even the atypical neuroleptic antipsychotics are extremely toxic to the body and well i think antidepressants uh, ssris and neuroleptics have a similar thing which is that once you're on them it becomes progressively more difficult to get off them yeah see, see aside from the fact that they are dangerous and toxic in many ways, with the neuroleptics, the new ones being more dangerous than the antidepressants in metabolic ways, certainly. The fact that, you, that it becomes progressively more difficult and nearly impossible sometimes for people to come off, this, off these medicines. Uh, I mean, I, I know a guy who, who has been taking neuroleptics for years and years, and he's got tardive dyskinesia. He's got all kinds of things going on. Within a week or two, when he stops his medication, all that stuff acts up terribly. And why? It's because of withdrawal. His receptors have been transformed by the medications. And, and therefore, he can no longer live a normal life at all. And this is not a relapse. This is not his illness coming back. These are the iatrogenic uh, disabilities that have been caused by the medications that resurface when the medication is, is discontinued. Do you think that the the sort of the magnitude of the implications of that is part of what um, kind of creates this defensiveness among professionals that they just can't really face the enormity of the fact because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people well, who have received brain damaging treatments in the name of caring for them and then have been permanently injured well, by the treatment. Yeah, I mean, there's virtually no research, no money spent on on figuring out what to do with those people. There's there's virtually no studies even on tardive dyskinesia. Uh, the answer of the drug companies about tardive dyskinesia was, well, we got this new medication that don't cause that. Which they turned out that they yeah. do cause. So, so, so <laughs> now they do cause it still, but they cause other things. Other things as well, yeah. And then, you know, you have, uh, it's almost like that is, you know, this may be very a sick thing to say, but these new side effects, these metabolic side effects, they actually turn out to be a boon for medicine because now you got people that have, and, and for a pharmaceutical industry, now you got people at the age of 30, 35 who have to take not only a neuroleptic that costs whatever, a thousand bucks a month, but they also have to take Lipitor, they also have to take, you know, blood pressure medicine, yeah. they also have to take anti diabetic medicine. Yeah. So they're creating markets, the, yeah. Yeah, by the time they they they, they add up all those pills, they, their their monthly Medicaid cost is like two, three thousand bucks. Yeah, the um, one of the one of the big sellers for Eli Lilly is Zyprexa, which causes diabetes, and one of the other big sellers for Eli Lilly is diabetes medication. Isn't <laughs> so, that something? Yeah, it's it's a, yeah. it's a very disturb can you just say a little bit about what is tardive dyskinesia for people who may not know who are listening? Well the interesting thing about tardive dyskinesia is that, that it happens to be the most visible 
uh, of the symptoms that is caused by medication, by neuroleptic antipsychotic medications, because they alter the actual receptor, brain receptor uh, structure, and, and they, they make the receptor what's called super sensitive. So for that, you know, the manifestation of that is, is you know, extra muscle movements, like mouth movements, jaw movements, facial grimacing, hands and feet kind of jerky movements that sometimes really interfere with the person's ability to function and sometimes look really disturbing also. But the tard of dyskinesia is only one element of that. You know, the, the other element is that, the, 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 you know, the actual the sort of psychosis is also there's a super sensitivity gets created for psychosis as well. And that's been even less research, and no, very few people admit that. So you get on the drugs to, to help you with your psychotic or extreme states, and then the drugs actually make you more vulnerable, there's a chance and they get that even the more intense may, states. Yeah. Make, yeah, there's a chance that the drugs make it much more likely for you to have a relapse than if you've never been on them. Yeah, and, we, and the uh, tardive dyskinesia as well also has a lot of cognitive deterioration. It really affects the mind because it's, it's a neurological problem that has this motor, physical well, that's, movement dis- that's problem. That's a third thing. Mm-hmm, that's actually mm-hmm. a separate thing. And, uh, you know, uh, several people talk about this, and, and, and there is some level of cell death involved, which is different from the tardive dyskinesia. It's called apoptosis. It's It's been demonstrated that over the years, there's a certain percentage of brain cells that die in people who take neuroleptics compared to people who don't. And, you know, they used to say that that was part of the illness, but now they're saying that it is certainly not part of the illness. It's certainly something that is is uh, caused by the neuroleptics. So, yeah, I think some psych- psychiatry textbooks still to this day have photos of so-called schizophrenic brains, and they look different. And actually, it's the medication that is responsible for the difference, not some kind of illness or disease. That well, it, it's a complicated subject, and you know, and but but it is clearly, and more and more people are saying that it, there's a clear confounding between uh, you know the sort of ventricle size and this atrophy that they're talking about, and the medication effects. There may be. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there absolutely never are any people that have some form of brain atrophy that starts at an early age. But I would say that that's a very tiny, and by the way, the schizophrenia label has nothing to do with it all. It's bogus to begin with, you know. So if you were to say, uh, for example, if you were to take a group of people who seem to have sort of neurological problems and may actually have some form of a very early dementia, which could be maybe less than 1% or, or, or 5% of all the people who get diagnosed with schizophrenia, if you were to take them out of the whole group and, and spend really a long time just researching them, you might, might find out that they have a viral disease that causes this. You might find out that they have a totally different thing. But psychiatry is not interested in that. Psychiatry likes to lump them together and, you know, use the label of schizophrenia because that's what they know for 75 years, for, for ni- or nearly 80 years, that's what they know. And it goes back to the original uh, Kreppelin, Emil Kreppelin was researching, um, well, that was called, he was calling it research, but he was researching all these people and came up with this diagnosis. And then later, there's the idea that, well, actually, a lot of the people that he was looking at have these all these physical illnesses, like encephalitis, which is, a, like you mentioned, a virus problem, and syphilis and other things. And he was just sort of lumping them all together. And that was the origins of saying that this is a physical, um, a physical disease, um, and then also there are other reasons why schizophrenia is really bogus. Partly is because it's so imprecise. I mean, you can get three different schiz- psychiatrists, and they just won't agree on whether a patient should receive uh, the same diagnosis or not. Well, but you see, psychiatrists are very creative when it comes to forming consensus. I mean, the, you, you can get the the problem is with this consensus is that it, it it's basically an agreement among psychiatrists to ignore the differences among people and to only focus on this, the very, very tiniest, n- narrow common ground. So if, let's say if there was, you know, 10% that people have in common who, who go under the label of schizophrenia or less, the 95%, 90% of things that, they're, that, that they distinct, they're, they are different is not being focused on, is not even being researched. The vast majority of study ignore the differences, 
for the sake of this so-called commonality, and that's why 99% of all studies that use the diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia are flawed and can be basically thrown out. Why, why is there such a strong... I mean, I know that there are, there are people, innovative people like Richard Bentall and yourself and other psychiatrists who are really trying to challenge that. But why, why does psychiatry hold on to this antiquated label of schizo- schizophrenia, this catch-all that just... Well, th- is it, it just it, sort of like in professional inertia? There's so much no. money that's been invested? And- well, I give a talk that's called Unrequited Schizophilia. <laughs> I, I once wrote a paper uh, about this subject, and uh, I give this talk, so it's not going to be possible for me to answer that question in one minute. Uh, I actually don't have that much more time. I know we're supposed to go a little longer, but we'll try. And I, I have a book in my hand. It's one of the few books I have in this new office of mine, by chance. It's called Schizophrenia, the Sacred Symbol of Psychiatry by Thomas Sass. I mean, there's so many answers to the question you asked. And it's a combination of many things. And uh, I would say that the, the most important answer is that it creates a shared delusion that there is this one holy, if you will, this holy grail of psychiatry that, that most serious psychiatrists uh, are after and that one day they will find the trove of treasures. I think that shared delusion is what keeps psychiatrists, especially those who deal with people who have, you know, kind of serious problems, keeps psychiatrists reassured that one day they're going to be just as good as other medical practitioners. One day they're going to be just as good as neurologists or just as good as any other because they're going to find the holy grail of psychiatry underneath that schizophrenia label. I think that might be the most powerful thing that keeps it going. Do you think that this, you mentioned the Nazis before, and do you think this go, reaches back into eugenics? And I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, you know, people maybe think that that's kind of a startling thing to say, but there really is a, a, a real danger of medicine starting to anal, uh, uh, imply the, an analysis of genes, and some people are different, they're not quite human, they're different nah, than us. And, no, I, I'm not going to go down that road with you, because that, to me, is too unsophisticated. I mean, genetics is quite a sophisticated undertaking by now. So to just say that it's like eugenics and that schizophrenia is, is that it's all the same, I don't believe that. I, I think that there may be some, and there certainly was a time when people had very strong feelings about that. I think today it's become much more than, it's become something else. It's become this, this sort of uh, red, huge red herring, you know, that everybody continues to pursue. And I don't think it's... I mean, I think fundamentally it has to do with not being willing to deal with madness. You know, it has to do with actually not being willing to confront it. So, So therefore, the schizophrenia label sort of locks it up, pretends to lock it up neatly in this package called schizophrenia. Whereas if you started to parse it down, if you started to break it down, you'd actually have to deal with what people are experiencing. And it's happening, you know, the movement, you know, some psychiatrists, it's happening. We now have to deal with hearing voices as opposed to basically just write it down as a symptom of schizophrenia. It now has become its own thing. And that's very fascinating. And that was a, there was a big story in the, in the New York Times yeah. magazine. That's actually, I think it's become a big thing in Europe. I think it's, it's maybe right. slower and, in the U.S. And the next frontier is dealing with, you know, beliefs that are not shared by the majority of people. Delusions and Delusions. paranoia, and yeah. You know, yeah. but then there's still another frontier that I think is the hardest frontier, which is to actually deal with what, you know, for lack of a better word, is I want to call a mental meltdown. You know, like I'm sure you uh, uh, have seen, if not experienced. Been through many times. <laughs> I'm you know, not quite sure what you're talking about, but it sounds familiar. And, you know, but I mean, when you're in the presence of someone melting down, you know it, and you feel it, and it touches you, you know, in your mo- innermost gut. And if you don't have any tools to deal with that, uh, you're going to freak out. And is that where the, the force and the medical Absolutely. science's willingness I, to yeah, use I think, violence I think and force? I think those and... chaotic situations, those meltdowns, those situations where people lose their boundaries, they fall apart, they're in a complete panic state, 
they don't know where the, their head is from their toes, you know, their whole body sensation falls apart. Those men- meltdowns, let's call them, uh, you know, they're not the same as hearing voices. They're not the same as having a delusional belief. They're an all-encompassing cataclysmic event. You know, and for that, you have to be prepared. And, you know, psychiatry is prepared itself only by doing, you know, hospital building walls, shock machines, drugs, restraints. The vast majority, that's what the vast majority of psychiatrists have done. And there's certainly no training for people yeah. to, just be, to just be with someone but that's in the that minority. state. And that, yeah. you know, once you have support for that, it turns out that these things are not deadly, that these things are not, you know, contagious. And they actually don't last. The and they people, don't last. They, that's, you know, that's the there myth are times people... when, they, when they seem to last for a long time, but that usually happens when you're being put in a situation, mostly in an institution, where you're completely disconnected from the world, you're not being understood, nobody reaches out to you, so that your only sort of refuge is madness. I mean, I've, you know, when going through, and maybe this is the last point that I'm, I'm going to get into, when going through old records from the time before medication, you often see people, you know, not many, but some, who end up in this kind of a nearly permanent state of, you know, oblivion and, 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 you know, disconnection and sort of madness, if you will. But I think it's those people, those are the people who've been shunned and who've been completely misunderstood. I'll give you one story and and then I'll sign off. I do want you to maybe say a little bit about INTAR as well, because I know that's a big, important part of your work these days. But go ahead with well, your story. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll tell you the story, but I'll, I'll say one word about INTAR, okay. not more. Because okay. the, the, the story is, was this nun who came into a, a mental institution around, you know, the 1910, 1915 in New York. And by the time she got there, she was we're very depressed and despondent and, and very worried about her you know, her affiliation to the church and was looking into... But she had been a nun for 25 years of her life, you know. And, and from that point on, when she, you know, she was, you know, she had no habit and never, asked, you know, she spent the rest of her life 40 more years in a mental institution without anyone ever, ever believing that she actually had been a nun and even t- talking to her about it. So, you know, she went into a state of madness that lasted for 30 years pretty much because she she didn't exist anymore really no one took her to be who she was and that's amazing you know that's shocking and that happens a lot you know this so to switch it to intar is a little bit hard i mean i i, I feel <laughs> intar is basically an organization that wants to remedy a lot of these things by pointing out that there are alternatives that are not coercive that are actually helpful that are if you will soft you know that are care you know that are understanding and and still uh, help a person recover so that's what intar stands for the international network of treatment alternatives for recovery and there are dozens of organizations yeah, there, and there, programs around the, the world, world that are there's some some countries that have almost like national programs that are more alternative than anything you'll find in america like in finland and sweden but i believe that intar is is you know about all the people that are in it, and so not about me. So I don't want to be a person really doing much talking about Intar. We I mean, did you sh- could talk as much about it as I can. Yeah, we did a show not too long ago with a bunch of interviews with people. Yeah. Do you think that the world is changing? I mean, the views that you're presenting have seemed radical for years, but, I mean, do you think that this this is the direction that we're headed, that ultimately people are waking up to this and institutions and professionals and family members are starting to say, hey, this is actually, the way we've been going doesn't make sense. Let's listen to people like Peter Stotzny. Is that... Uh, I don't see it happening yet. Don't see it happen. Are you hopeful? Um, that it yeah, happen? there's a, there are a few rays of hope here and there. You know, California trying to put some money into, into some innovation. And uh, I, you know, some countries, like I say, in England, UK has been doing a fair amount of national rethinking of mental health stuff uh in america it's not happening you know the you know the the president's report the freedom commission was basically uh bypassed a lot of these issues didn't address them at all 
And so I don't quite know. I mean, the, the Association of Community Psychiatrists in America has now uh, been more interested in recovery. But frankly, you know, and I don't want to get started on a, new, on a new subject, so maybe I shouldn't even say that, but the whole recovery paradigm is a little hollow, you know. It, it, it doesn't include a lot of these issues we're talking about. In many cases, sometimes it's, it does. It seems like the word recovery has now been defined to you can be recovered and be on medication and on disability and absolutely. part of the system. It's like it's lost its yeah. substance. Well, well I, don't, I don't want to keep you beyond your... Unfortunately, I have to go. So Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been really interesting. I'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Well, Thanks. you know, anytime we can arrange it, I'd be happy to. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. You've been listening to an interview with Dr. Peter Stotsny, who is a psychiatrist based in New York City and is one of the lead organizers of INTAR, the International Network of Treatment Alternatives for Recovery. If you want more information about INTAR, you can go to their website, which is um, www.intarintar.org. That's about all the time we have this week. Thanks a lot for tuning in on Madness Radio. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. If you'd like more information, check us out on the web at madnessradio.net. We're not crazy. The system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3, Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net.